Hi everyone, this is Mr. Wells, and this is a little um, review of impulse and momentum. So momentum is a pretty basic idea. The definition of momentum of an object um, is that the momentum, which is symbolized by P, and it is a vector, is equal to the mass of the object times the velocity of the object, and velocity is also a vector. So the direction of the momentum vector is the same as the direction of the velocity vector for the object. Now this is linear momentum. Later we will talk about rotational or angular momentum, excuse me. So um, it is a vector and the direction matters. The units are pretty basic. Um, the units are just mass units, which are kilograms and multiply that by meters per second, the velocity units. So these don't have a special name, it's always just kilograms times meters per second. So Newton kind of called this the quantity of motion. He was trying to quantify how much motion something has. So this is kind of an artificial construct. Why do we use um, mass times velocity? Well, it turns out it's a really useful idea. So. Um, we do have to remember that it is a vector. So this is especially important when we talk about momentum when it changes. So I've been watching the World Series here, and so if a pitch comes in and it has a momentum, um, let's say it has, for example, oh, I don't know, 25 units of momentum, and later it ends up going in the other direction, the batter hits it, and let's say later it's going that, uh, let me call this the initial, and later it has a final momentum equal to, um, let's say 30 units of momentum in that final direction, um, the direction matters. So when we calculate the change in velocity or change in momentum, um, in this case, since we have straight lines, we can consider one direction positive and the other negative. So if I consider right to be positive and left to be negative, then our change in momentum will be the final momentum minus the initial. We always do final minus initial. And that would be, since the final is to the left, I'm going to call that negative 30 minus the initial, which was 25. So the change in momentum was negative 55 units of momentum. Um, and let's just say that's kilograms times meters per second. I'm not sure how reasonable these numbers are, but just for illustration purposes, they're easy to work with. So, you know, some say would say if your momentum changes from 25 to 30, that that's a change of five. Um, but realize that this thing had to change direction. So the momentum had to go from 25 in one direction all the way down to zero and then back to 30 in the other direction. So that's a much bigger change. So computing the momentum of an object is not extremely difficult. Um, the next thing we want to look at is how does momentum change or how do you change the momentum of the object. So I've got a shopping cart here and let's just say the velocity is equal to zero and if the velocity is equal to zero of course the momentum is equal to zero. So the question is well, how do you give it some momentum? Well it's pretty obvious that you would apply a force to the shopping cart. Okay, So a force can change the state of motion of the object, so this is very much related to Newton's laws as well. So a force will cause an acceleration, which will cause the velocity to change. Okay, So we are going to apply a force. And so if we look at this, um, we can think of the change of momentum. If I apply a force and later that cart has a velocity of, say, two units. I'm not going to try, well, I'll redraw the cart real quick here. So I apply a force and later it's moving. And now it has a velocity equal to, say, two meters per second. Now it has momentum that it didn't have before. Okay. And we can also, just in terms of notation, we can think about the change in momentum. Uh, we can symbolize that with deltas. Change in momentum is equal to the mass of the object times its change in velocity.
technically momentum could change by also changing the mass of the object, but that's pretty rare. So nearly everything we deal with has the momentum changing because the velocity is changing. Now, Newton actually stated his second law in terms of momentum. Instead of saying the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration, what he stated is that the net force, and we'll write it in vector form here, so F net there, is equal to the derivative of mo momentum or the rate of change of the momentum. So force on an ob the net force on an object is equal to the rate of change of its momentum. And as you know, we can think of that as the derivative with respect to time of the mass times the velocity. And so we're just going to use the product rule, do a little calculus here. And so the net force product rule. We'll take the first thing times the derivative of the second, so the mass times dv dt plus velocity times the derivative of mass with respect to time. Okay, so that's the product rule, and you might be saying to yourself, well, Newton's second law doesn't look like that. Um, but for nearly everything that we do, um, the mass remains the same. In this class, that's always going to be the case. Um, it's pretty rare in, in any instances to have mass changing significantly. Um, the, the best example of something where the mass does change significantly would be something like a rocket, where the, the it's, it's somewhere upwards of 90% of the mass of a rocket when it's on the launch pad is the fuel. So as the fuel is burned, the mass of the rocket is going down significantly. So that would be a case where you couldn't ignore that. But we're not rocket scientists, so for everything in real life, um, the mass is constant, so the derivative of it is zero, and you just end up with what we already know for Newton's second law is the net force is equal to the mass times the derivative of velocity. And of course, the derivative velocity is the acceleration. So we often just write it ma. And the vector symbols just tell us that the direction of the net force is the same as the direction of the acceleration vector. Now, if we have a simple case um, where we have a constant force, or if we have a case where we just worry about the average force, we're not worried about the details of how it's changing with time, we can go back and instead of writing this in terms of the, the differentials dv and dt, we can write this just in terms of deltas. So the net for the force on the object or is equal to its mass times the change in velocity over the change in time. So that change in velocity of the change in time, if you remember, is average acceleration. And then if we multiply both sides by delta t, we get the, ma the force times the time it's applied for is equal to the mass of the object times its change in velocity. So we've just really taken Newton's second law and rearranged it so that it is written in terms of this. Now the left hand side is given a name. This is called the impulse. And the right hand side also has a name. That would be the change in momentum. So the impulse on an object is equal to its change in momentum. So yeah, if you think about changing the momentum of an object, it doesn't matter 
simply how much force you apply. It depends on how long you apply the force. So if you go back to my grocery cart example, um, I could hit it with a hammer and apply a force of say 100 newtons on the cart, but that's not going to be applied for very long. So I'm really not necessarily going to change the, the velocity of the cart very much. I'm not going to give it much momentum. But if I, instead of hitting it with a hammer applying a force of 100 newtons, if I steadily push it with a force of 100 newtons for a long period of time, it's going to accelerate. And as it accelerates, it's going to be picking up more and more momentum. So the change in momentum is dependent not only on the force, but how long you apply it for. So we take this idea and we basically write down what we call the impulse momentum theorem. Okay. Um, so the change in momentum, instead of writing m delta v, we can write it as delta p is equal to the force times the time interval it's applied for. So that's the impulse and momentum theorem. So that's a very useful thing. And there are lots of cases where um, we don't want to know, you know, the force varies, um, things can be very complicated, but if I know how much the momentum of an object changes, um, then we can pretty easily figure out the average force. For example, if you bounce a basketball on the floor, um, it, it'd be pretty easy to measure the velocity before it hits the floor, the velocity that it rebounds with, and from that you could figure out how long uh, if we can measure how long it's in contact with the floor, then we can figure out how much force was applied to the ball. Okay, so um, a little bit about impulse. Um, impulse in your book is symbolized by the letter, capital letter J, okay, not to be confused with units of joules, so you have to understand the context of this. Um, and so that's going to equal the force times the time interval. Uh, sorry, there's a T in there. And the units on this would be force units, which are newtons, times time units, which are seconds. And if you look at this, uh, newtons times seconds should also be equivalent to kilograms times meters per second. And if you do the work it out, it also works out that way. Okay. Now, sometimes the force is variable. Um, it varies with time. So um, we may have something like this. Uh, so if I have a force versus time graph, and let's say I have a force that changes with time, and I want to find out if I think about the area of this, again, we go back to our calculus ideas where I take a little area and I estimate, I divide this up into some rectangles, and the area of each rectangle, if I call that a delta T, so the area is equal to the sum of F, I'll just say sub I, times delta T from I equal 1 to N. Okay, and again, this notation, if we look at this, that would be a good estimate of the area of that. But if you look at this, F times delta T, well, that's just impulse. So basically what I'm getting at is the area is equal to the impulse. And we know that if we have a varying force, we can find the area of the curve is done with an integral. So I know that another way to define impulse is that the impulse J is equal to the integral of the force times dt, the integral of F dt, or the area under a force versus time graph. So that's very useful. So if you have a 
steady force or one where we just talk about the average force, we can think of it in terms of just deltas. If we have a force that varies with time, it's not the same, and we know the details of it as a function of time, or given a force time graph, then you can find impulse that way. So that's a quick review of momentum and impulse.